Hello everyone and um, welcome to Thursday. For those of you that have missed me, I'm back. For those of you that haven't, sorry, I'm back. Um, so we're going to go through as normal uh, an hour of editing today, but we're going to start off with something slightly different um, at kind of the request. I can't remember who actually made the request. It may have been Brian, I think, but if Brian's online, um, yell, but we'll have a look at it um, later on. Um, so what have we got today? We've got the full spread of the earth. We've got pretty much New Zealand across to uh, the west coast of the US. So hello, wherever you are. Um, sorry for those of you that's late. Sorry for those of you that it's early. Um, but if you were in England, then it would be three o'clock in the afternoon. That'd be wonderful. Um, so let's get going um, on our session today. Um, first thing we're going to start with is the update. So we are editing today in Capture One. The current version is version 21. And today, um, about, I think it was about two or three hours ago, um, a new version, which is 21.1.1, uh, got delivered. Um, that version has got a couple of extra cameras supported in it. The Probably the big headline with it is it now supports um, lossless compressed RAW from Sony's A1, um, which is big news. Um, and there's also a lot of bug fixes in there as well. So if you're running version 21, please make sure you update to 21.1.1. Uh, the way to check, if you go into your About screen, you'll see in that box just above me when you go to the um, capture one about um, it should say 14.1.1 if you're on the latest if you are not on 21 not a problem most of what we run through today will be possible in version 20 um, which is version 13 if you look at your about screen before that there will be some tools that we have that maybe aren't, aren't going to be accessible to you but have a look on CaptureOne.com for upgrade options. If you don't have Capture One and you haven't ever seen this program before or whatever, um, then go to CaptureOne.com, download a free trial. It's 30 days free trial, unlimited. You, you can do anything with it. They don't do the stupid watermarking thing or anything. Um, and have a play. So let's go on uh, to the... And I, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but I think it was Brian that asked about this. Super Resolutions. Um, so I've had a bit of a play with these, um, kind of on request, but actually out of interest uh, more than anything. So um, a couple of weeks ago, Adobe um, released an update to their camera raw um, called Super Resolution. It's actually an add-on to their Enhance feature. So they already had something called Enhance, um, and that Enhance tool, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, that Enhance tool allowed you to get more details um, as you increase the size of an image, effectively, or um, it allowed for smoother lines without the jagged edges and all that sort of stuff. And it used some clever technology to do that. What's happened now is they've released this thing called Adobe Camera Raw Super Resolution. So although it's part of Photoshop, you actually have to do it through the raw file. So it's done at the point that you import the file into Photoshop as a raw. Um, so it's not a filter, it's not a plugin or anything like that. It's done through Adobe Camera Raw. But of course, there are loads of other ways of blowing up an image. Um, and those ways, of course, are um, with either plugins or using your raw processor or using um, your native pixel editor. So I've just done a load of samples with these five different methods. And we're going to run through them today. Now, just as one thing to bear in mind with streaming, um, we're broadcasting at 2560 by 1440. Of course, when we switch between different screens, there's a little bit of a delay for the screen to sort of kick in um, for the stream and keep everything nice and sharp. So hold on for a couple of seconds as we go through the image samples. That will hopefully uh, hopefully sort things out. Okay, um, let's have a look then at our sample images, which is the first thing, I guess. Now, our sample images, actually, are some old ones of mine. Um, these are very old um, shots. They were taken on a Canon 5D Mark II. It's a 21 megapixel camera. Now, why would we be using those instead of the 151 megapixel images that, that I normally shoot? Um, and actually, the reason is that, effectively, I'm not concerned about blowing up a 151 megapixel image. And I think the whole megapixel thing is starting to take off again a little bit with this super resolution talk. Um, 151 megapixel image, I can print huge, certainly bigger than the arc of your eye can see before it starts to lose or degrade its resolution. So where I see this super resolution stuff coming into its own is in older images that you want to upscale. 
that's where actually the real value in this is because the modern camera stuff that we've got if you're shooting 40 50 60 80 100 megapixels plus generally speaking you you've probably got a pretty sharp image already and it's probably going to be good enough to blow up to a very big size to start with so all these samples are done in a 21 megapixel image and they are simply done just to see what happens when we blow them up to double the size now bear in mind 200 percent in width and height is actually quadrupling the number of pixels so we go from a 20 megapixel or a 21 megapixel image up to an 84 megapixel image so don't let the 200 percent fool you we're, we're effectively quadrupling these images so let's have a look at what we actually did that method now all of these programs obviously have a lot of fine-tuned settings that you can do. In each and every case, including Capture One, I have not touched the defaults. They've been set to screen sharpening, and they've been set to whatever the program has defaulted to do before shipping it out and exporting it as a file. There is one complication in this, which is Capture One has a slightly different image editing system um, as Photoshop and Lightroom. So the colors look different. Um, because we haven't touched it at all. So Capture One's example, the colors will look a little bit different. Other than that, these are literally like for like um, as they were as defaults. So before we go into the actual images, let's have a look at the timings because this is quite interesting. I passed through four 21 megapixel files, not big files, through a pretty beefy system. So this thing has 192 gig of RAM. I can't even remember whether it's 10 or 12 processors. Um, two um, Radeon 32 gig GPUs or cards, um, a load of kit in there basically, and it can throw all of that weight at these programs. Photoshop, it resized all four images in eight seconds flat, no problem. Topaz's Gigapixel, 11 minutes. Alien Skins Blow Up, which is a filter in Photoshop, 58 seconds. Um, Capture One exported all the files at double their size at 12 seconds and the new super resolution from Adobe, um, the camera raw extension, um, that's 38 seconds. So those of you looking at the gigapixel thing and thinking I'm making that up, here's the actual screen. Um, and what you'll actually see on the right hand side, um, just under that button at the top, you'll see the time per image. It does them serially. Um, and effectively I was sat there watching that screen for 11 minutes, waiting it for it to just increase the size on four pretty old, pretty small images. I'm not a fan of that, um, especially bearing in mind how quick in relative terms all the other methods are. But anyway, we'll see what the results come out with. So first off, let's have a look at our dude with the scarf. And all of these things, if you're on 2560, um, so in YouTube, if you've gone to the 1440p um, button in the bottom corner, You'll see this as real size. Um, hopefully now the screen is adjusted, um, the stream is adjusted, and you can see the difference. And there is a clear difference in this one. Of course, we've got the color shift in Capture One. That's, that's to be expected. But look at the sharpness differences between that one in super resolution, so our middle top, gigapixel and bottom left, which again is actually really sharp. It's done a good job of creating a sharp image at 100% crop. Photoshop's own just normal resize, so that's a doubling of size in just an image size in Photoshop with bicubic, which is the default um, interpolation. Blow up, not that impressive in this case. This was actually a relatively sharp image to begin with. It was in focus. Um, it's just, it can't really quite interpret it um, that well. Capture One's done a good job, as I say, apart from, um, obviously it looks different um, with the color shift, but of course we'd change the color in, in Capture One anyway. Um, but certainly in this case, Gigapixel and Super Resolution have done a very good job of making sure that, that image is crisp and sharp when you quadruple its area. Let's have a look at this guy's stubble. we have been very, uh, very unfair. So right up into that top lip. Um, top left is the normal Photoshop image, just doubled size. Super Resolution, middle top, um, looks very sharp. We're going to come back to that. Bottom left, Gigapixel. Again, looks pretty sharp. In fact, it's probably the sharpest on the screen out of all of these ones. Blow up three, pretty disappointing actually in this one, again with its default settings. But Capture One here, and it's interesting, Capture One has done a really good job on those hairs. And I'd say there's probably a difference between when an image is super sharp, and this was actually the focus point on this image, was actually on his, his um, lips and his eyes. 
when the item is dead on, bang on in focus, and there's detail, Capture One can just extract that perfectly well on its own. If you compare it to Blow Up, if you compare it to Photoshop on its own, it's done a good job of creating a sharp image. It is not as sharp, though, as Adobe Super Resolution or Gigapixel AI. However, look at the Adobe Super Resolution, so the top middle one, and look around the bottom lip and look at the hairs and look at some of those color noise artifacts that you're starting to see. So yes, it sharpened it and we've got what looks like a very crisp image. But if you look carefully, remember these are 100% crops. I'm not being unfair. We haven't zoomed in at you know, 400% or anything like that. If you're viewing this at 2560 by 1440, you're seeing this at 100% as it would be printed. And I'm quite disappointed in the amount of noise that Super Resolution has brought in. Gigapixel has not, and that's an interesting difference there on its own. So while Gigapixel took a lot longer to process these images, it's actually done a better job of outputting than Adobe Super Resolution, which is currently the one that everyone's talking about. So let's look at the female model and the eye. Now this is specifically used, I actually chose this one on purpose, because her eye wasn't correctly in focus. So if we look on the top left, the Photoshop one, it's blown up. It's not particularly sharp thanks to the blow up, but it also wasn't very sharp to begin with. Super resolution has, I would argue, over sharpened it. And, and I'm a bit concerned about that because what I'm also seeing again is those noise artifacts, those, those um, Luma artifacts, there's color noise in there as well. Um, we're seeing almost the edges of some, uh, some I guess, purple, um, sort of purple and, and green fringing and so on. Um, and I'm not a fan of it being over sharp. Couch one on the bottom right, you know, it, it's done as good a job, I would argue, as Blow Up 3. It's done better than Photoshop on its own, but it's not done anything, you know, sensational in this case. Gigapixel has done a good job of sharpening without increasing noise, but it doesn't quite look as crisp as that super resolution in the top middle. Uh, Brian's just saying it was Brian that asked. There we go. I, I did remember, right? Brian's just said super resolution has whitened his teeth. Let me just check. Um, has it? I think certainly Gigapixel has whitened his, his teeth a little bit. Um, but hold that thought on teeth. We'll come back to that. Um, so let's have a look at the eye one. And I'm, I'm generally sort of in a place where if there was somewhere in between sort of the capture one slash blow up um, version and super resolution, I'd be happier. And it's not quite Gigapixel's output for my, um, for my liking. Um, Okay, let's have a look at her lips. And here's your teeth, Brian. Um, so if we uh, if want to have a look at the teeth comparison. Um, so again, the original top left, Photoshop. Did it very quickly, um, but it's pretty mushy. It's, it's not exactly sharp and on point. Super resolution. Look at the noise above where I've put the word super resolution. It's actually introduced patterns into her skin. Um, now, these are raw, out of camera. There is no retouching on them whatsoever. They are the CR2 files, as, as they were at the time. I wouldn't be happy with that amount of new noise being introduced to the image before I've even started editing. Um, so, yes, it's sharp. Yes, it's really grabbed those little specular highlights. You know, to an extent, it's, it's sharpened up the tooth. And actually, you can see it's, it's actually sharpened the edges um, of the tooth, making them very clear. Um, but it just feels a little bit over the top. Gigapixel's done a good job, but actually on the highlights, it hasn't really sharpened, which is surprising. But on the tooth, it's, you know, it's flattened it. It's, it's um, made it glossier. Um, we've got a nice sharp edge on it. Blow Up 3, I would say, has done a good job, actually, in this um, image. Um, and Capture One, I would say, is probably the, the least um, improved over the standard um, Photoshop Blow Up in this case. And you'll sort of get the, the, the idea here. So we've gone through four different examples and there isn't actually a clear winner. If you want the very, very sharpest version, Super Resolution seems to do a good job apart from in our scarf. And in our scarf, actually Gigapixel does a better job. But what Super Resolution is bringing, unfortunately, is some noise. Now, this is all fine for portraits and stuff like that, but a lot of us shoot landscape and, and buildings and so on. So I just wanted to look at the textures and stuff when we're on a landscape mode. So this is that famous sign in Amboy, uh, the Roy's um, Motel. Now look at, the and genuinely, the incredible job that Super Resolution has done on that corrugated metal. So 
This is an old metal sign. The original of this, you know, it's a 21 megapixel file. It was quite a distance away. To get this blown up and have it crisp and sharp is going to be a real challenge. So super resolution, really good job. I'm, I'm actually really impressed with the texture and the detail in it. But if you look up at the yellow um, part of the, the neon light, there's a bit of, I want to say sort of mushiness, but it, there's, there's a bit of blending um, that doesn't seem quite right up there. But overall, it's actually picked out all those details and it's done a really good job. Gigapixel surprisingly hasn't. Now, Gigapixel is the one that claims it's artificial intelligent. They claim that um, it does all the detail enhancing and stuff like that. But it is way off super resolution, um, so Adobe's version, in terms of what it's actually delivered as the output. Blow up, pretty disappointing in this one. It's kept it clean, and it's certainly better than Photoshop on its own, but it's not exactly what I'd call sharp at that higher resolution, um, the, the blow up, as it were. And then Capture One, again, it's kept it clean. It's kept the detail. The details are actually slightly sharper than that of blow up. But in general terms, it, it is falling second fiddle, as it were, to super resolution, as, as all the others do. So in this case, when we've got something that has texture, remember the risk with super resolution is it's adding in noise and texture and, and bumps and, and, and lumps and so on. When you want texture, this is doing an amazing job. But here's the problem. Because this is the same sign, but a different part of it. And when I want texture, it's great. When I don't want texture, it's adding it. It's adding noise. And if you look around that sign, the, the shadow part of the, the white upright of the sign into the blue sky, it's picking up some of the details that were in the original. So you can see elements of it in the original Photoshop version. And it's adding noise because it's using it as texture. and It's using it as detail. Interestingly on this one, Gigapixel's actually cleaned up all the noise. It's cleaned up all the original noise, as well as um, not introducing any of its own. So from that perspective, it's in this case, it's done an incredible job. And in fact, if I looked at that part of the sign, Gigapixel would win 9 times out of 10. But if I look at this part of the sign, then I'm back to super resolution being the winner. And this is the problem with these tools. Different tools are going to be the right tool for different approaches in terms of what you're trying to scale up. What I've seen in this so far, if you're trying to scale up something that is already sharp, so let's take the example of, if I can remember, our Stubble, Mr. Stubble guy. In this case here, generally, you know, Capture One has done a good job. If I compare the top left, which is a standard Photoshop, just resize, to Capture One's sharpened output, the sharpening that Capture One does, it's as good as any without introducing any noise or artifacts or anything like that. Gigapixel, don't get me wrong, does an incredible job with this shot. But, again, it also took a long time to process and it's an extra plugin that goes in after you've done all your other adjustments. So you're going to do your adjustments in either Capture One or Lightroom or whatever. You're then going to bring it into Gigapixel, run it through another set of software, and we always talk about this, you know, use the least possible number of steps because those are the ways of keeping your image clean and clear. So overall, are the, let's say, are the super resolution things worth it? Well, yes, they are. Um, if you need to blow up a older, smaller image and you want to get all that detail back, then great, use one of these tools. It comes with Photoshop, the super resolution tool, as part of Adobe Camera Raw. But you can only introduce it into your image by using Adobe's Camera Raw. You can't use this as an add-on to something like Capture One. If you want to use Gigapixel, great, it's a paid tool, it's an extra tool. Again, you're going to be using it after you've done your raw processing. It's not part of that raw process. You can bring in a raw file into Gigapixel, but then you're using their raw engine um, to do that. If you want to use the filters into to Photoshop, then Alien Skin, to be honest, many years ago, Alien Skin was right up there with, with its ability to interpolate images. Looking at these results that I've just gone through, I think it's kind of lost its way. I know that it's been version 3 for a long time. Um, certainly, Gigapixel has taken over from that. The new introduction of Super Resolution has obviously um, has, has improved things yet again. But I keep coming back to the idea that, actually... If I'm not going to scale up, I'm going to stick in Capture One. If I am going to scale up, 
and my image is already sharp and I don't want to introduce noise, then I'm happy just using the scaling in the process recipe in Capture One. There may be circumstances where it's slightly soft, it's slightly off, it's you want to get bigger than it can possibly go um, normally, in which case these tools are wonderful and, and you know use them. They're a tool to do exactly that, but it's a very specific tool. What I've seen quite worryingly around is everyone is now loading in all their pictures and automatically super resolutioning them. You're going to find you're introducing noise into your images. If we look at you know, our, our image here of that um, Amboy sign, the amount of noise that you're actually introducing into an image that didn't have a huge amount of noise to start with, there's no need for it. And, and even when you go into uh, where we are, eyes, as it were, you know, that texture that it's put in to that file, it wasn't there. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to introduce all of that extra noise um, into the system. So, genuinely, you know, they're, they're clever tools. I'm not going to diss them as a, as a tool set. If you need to use one to blow up an image, by all means, go for it. Um, later on, so after we finish this broadcast, I'm actually going to put a link in the description of this video so you can download these files um, and compare like for like um, on a full screen um, without the, the difference of streaming because I'm sure it's had an effect on it. But, you know, genuinely use it. It's the same in Capture One. We talk about it all the time. Use a tool where you need to. Don't use a tool if you don't. Um, because what you might find is, yes, it's getting you a result that you wanted, but it might also be introducing some things that you didn't. Okay, so uh, with that said, so there you go, Brian. Um, that was your that was your own special, unique session on super resolution. Um, so where are we, uh, Derek? Um, yeah, exa so yeah, it makes you pause before committing to any single program. You know, honestly, each of these examples, there are different pros and cons for each of those different programs. Um, you know, in general, super resolution does a good job across the board, but it has some side effects. Gigapixel does a great job across the board but it's very, very slow, um, and you can't integrate it into your raw workflow. You've got to do all this stuff later. Blow up, a little bit disappointing, but you know, genuinely, Capture One can do some of this stuff um, to a certain point, and then you've got to ask yourself, if you're blowing up a 21 megapixel image to, let's say, 160 megapixels, really? Because we can't invent stuff that wasn't there, AI or no AI. It's, it's just, it wasn't captured, so you're inventing pixels. So just be a bit careful with it. Um, uh, Paul is saying, yeah, super resolution is creating textures where there are none. Yeah, exactly. And what it's doing, and, and to be fair, it's doing, a, a, it's quite clever. It's, it's looking for patterns where it thinks that, well, if that's a pattern that's going across here, then there should have been some stuff in between as it blows it up. And the, the risk and the issue with it is that you're introducing extra stuff that, that's just not there. The other thing to bear in mind, human skin, if you make it too sharp, our skin has imperfections. It's meant to. Um, you know, and, and the idea of shining a light on all of those individual pores and cells and marks and whatever else, you know, I, I'm not a fan of over-processing people's skin, but, you know... Every now and then you're going to show someone a picture and they might not be your biggest fan if you run it through this. Um, and Andrea's saying, yeah, use it for DJI pictures or pictures because of the 12 megapixels. Absolutely. Um, so for a drone shot, for example, where you're limited in camera size um, because of the sensor that's on board, you know, if this is the difference between getting something printable out or not, then go for it. But again, the right tool for the right purpose. Don't just use it as a blanket um, system. Right, so there we go. Um, let's have a look at our Capture One. Let's actually get into Capture One and do some editing. Um, so we are going to start with Doug's shot of, is it Black Church Rock, I think he said. Um, and the challenge is, I think, um, from memory, I'm just going to, just for your reference, I'm going to turn on diffraction correction. Capture One has already loaded in the right lens profile for this shot. Um, at 18 millimeters on that lens, it's probably okay for distortion. We, you know, if we think it's distorted, we could bump it up. Generally speaking, with landscape images, cities are different, architecture is different, but with a landscape image, you can get away with a bit of distortion. And the risk of, of fixing that distortion is you're actually losing. You can see if I turn the crop tool on, that distortion fix, let's even put it to 100, I'm going to lose some of the border of this shot. So I'm actually losing resolution. Good job we've got 
tools to be able to upgrade it. But, you know, in a landscape world, we don't have to worry too much about a line being completely straight, um, about parallel lines down a road and stuff like that. So if you don't need to use the distortion correction, don't. Um, you're going to get more of your image in the shot and then you can play with it. Um, in this case, I don't think there's much in the way of purple fringing. I had a little look um, around the edges, and even though they're high contrast, there's nothing really standing out. So that's always going to be our first stop with any image, the lens profile area. We talk about that quite a lot. The next one is always going to be typically white balance. Um, and this is actually the, the point that Doug um, came along with, which was how do I fix this? Because it was actually taken with a Lee filter. Um, I think it was a heavy um, stop filter. And it's got a very strong blue color cast. And the issue is that when he fixed that, so I think um, you said it went up to about 9,000 to fix it, uh, which is pretty high. So when we get to there, we change the properties of this rock. We change the properties of the sky. Everything feels a bit wrong for getting this ground back to neutral. Um, so one of the ways is obviously you can do that and then use a color editor to bring it back. Or, and I think it's actually a bit simpler than that, which is, I like the blue of the sky. I kind of want to keep that. I, I, this needs to be a little more natural. Why don't we just use a gradient filter? So if we're happy, and this is what, you know, if I'm wrong, then then yell, Doug, if you're online. But what Doug had said is, I'm happy with the color of this rock up here, and I don't want to have to fix that later as a result of moving the whole white balance for the image. So don't. Um, what we can do is leave the white balance for the whole image where it is as shot. We can draw a gradient mask. And I'm going to start the gradient falling off here. And I'm going to have it finish by about here. So when we draw a gradient mask, we always click and hold the starting point, which is where it's 100%. Stretch while it's still held down on the mouse up until the point where you want it to be 0%. And that determines your fall off. If I want the fall off to be softer, I need to make this distance bigger. If I want the fall off to be harder, I just make this distance very short and you're going to pretty much see a line across the image which we generally don't like so i'm going to do a really soft fall off there what it means is at this point here what i'm about to do is going to have 50 percent effect at this point here no effect whatsoever so mask press m on your keyboard to make it appear disappear with it disappeared i'm now going to use our white balance tool just like before to reset the white balance in this foreground we might also want to bring up a bit of tint just to neutralize it. And there we go. Now, for those thinking that the gradient mask has introduced this weird um, black line, it hasn't. Um, this is where the tide mark is, basically, and the rock is genuinely striped um, in that way. But with that simple change, just using a gradient instead of doing it across the whole image, we can change the corre or, well, correction, I guess, of this image in the foreground without affecting anything up here in the top. Now, with that said, you want to be a bit careful that the difference doesn't become too great between the foreground and the light that's around um, in the ambient sky and so on. If that distance is too great, and I'll show you what I mean by that, um, if the sky is way too blue or bluey green, let's say, and the foreground is this neutral color, that doesn't make sense. Our, our brain can't process it because how can this light, which is effectively bounced back out of the sun and the sky, be neutral when this is so not neutral. So if you are going to do this, oops, changed the wrong layer. If you are going to do this, make sure that you're comfortable with the difference between the white balance of your target and the white balance of the original background. In this case, that's quite a big leap from 8.6 down to 5.3. So I'm actually going to pull the overall image up a little bit warmer. Not a huge amount, um, but just a bit just so we've got a little bit of a uh, little bit of give in it. Now, weirdly, when I first saw this image, I actually thought that it was a little bit offline, um, but it's not. It's actually this um, sloping down. And I think, I think Doug said um, this was the last shot he did before he got very, very wet. Um, but then the rest of the, the image edits on this, what I'm actually tempted to do on it is put in another adjustment layer. So this one is going to be our, sorry, foreground white balance so always label your layers sometimes i forget to do it and it gets very confusing um this one we're going to call um uh, foreground lead in and there's a reason that i'm not doing this on that white balance layer 
if you remember the white balance one is pretty global and it goes actually up to the rock the lead in i'm actually going to have a little bit of a, um, a fall off of light and i don't want it to follow that same gradient so i'm actually going to have a gradient that starts right the way at the bottom and finishes probably about here um, by the way when you're drawing a gradient mask for those that don't know this um, if you hold down the shift key it goes in 45 degree increments and keeps it straight if you want it to so when you want to draw a straight gradient hold down the shift key and it'll, it'll keep it exactly on 45 degrees as you turn the mouse so with that gradient mask loaded in i'm just going to go into our exposure tab so top left this little uh, histogram icon and we're going to just pull down that exposure and all that's doing is it's helping me lead up to this rock it's, it's taking the distraction of this foreground one away and there's two reasons i'm doing that the first is this is clearly the subject. The second is our foreground is actually slightly out of focus. So the focal point that um, Doug actually dialed in was somewhere up here. We can see this is nice and sharp up here. In the foreground, you know, without a long exposure with focus stacking, that's a challenge. Um, so without doing any of that stuff, um, you're going to struggle um, to get more of it in. You could have shot, I guess, at f16. Um, for you know in theory either iso um what would you be at 800 it's going to be a bit bit noisy or for a longer period of time but then you've got wetter so um that's that's the choice that was made at f8 you're going to have a challenge with that depth of field so rather than drawing attention to this foreground because the temptation normally would be to make a feature of that if it's out of focus and our whole point is leading up to this point up here let's use darkness as well to bring the um the viewer up there if this bit here is now turned too dark, which in my view it possibly has, I can go to my mask and I can go to our eraser button and make my eraser smaller so I can either right click, change the tool settings or use the square brackets. Left makes it smaller, right makes it bigger or you can use the new shortcuts um, in 21 um, but I'm not going to list out all of those because that's going to get very confusing. And all I'm going to do with a um, eraser which has got an opacity of probably 40 or 50 is just pulled down from here. When I first click, Capture One is going to say, do you want to rasterize the mask? We've covered this a few times. Um, rasterizing the mask changes it from being an editable gradient into something that's as if you'd painted it. Now, once you do this, it's irreversible. So I'm happy to, because I'm happy with the position of the mask, and I know I want to remove some of it. So in order to do that, I'm going to say, yes, please rasterize it. The mask is still there, but I can't now edit it as a gradient. It's literally as if I've painted that mask in. But it means now that I can pull this line down with my eraser so that this bottom corner doesn't get too dark because it was already pretty dark on the left-hand side from the light. So that gives us a nice lead up. With the same tool, I'm actually then going to, in fact, no, we're going to go up to our foreground one because it covers more area. And I'm going to use that to increase a bit of clarity. Again, not too much don't do this 100 bad idea if you push clarity too much as the those of you that are on here all the time will know you get um you get artifacts you get halos around edges you get sharp lines you get um drawn lines around um, high contrast points lots of bad reasons not to do it but clarity on its own is actually a really powerful tool if used in moderation especially in seascapes especially with rocks if I go out to this rock here and just temporarily, so if I hold down the Option or Alt key on the keyboard on any of these tools and click, it turns it off and let go, it's back on. So that's with clarity, that's without clarity. So you can see here it's quite soft. Here we've got a bit more definition, especially in those mid-tones. So the challenge is um, what's the right mix in, in terms of doing it don't overdo clarity it's tempting especially on seascapes because you get all the texture of the rocks but just be really careful that you don't push it too far um where are we a couple of questions um so i'm going to just cover um kevin's question um and I, this is i'm believing <laughs> about the blow up stuff so super resolution yes it is worth kevin mentioning about um, viewing distance so when we talk about um blowing up an image Remember, your viewing distance has an impact of it. Your eye sees as an arc. And the resolution you need for something to be sharp from 10 meters away is very different to the resolution you need for something to be sharp from 1 meter away. Billboards are printed at something ridiculous. I mean, some of them are like 4 DPI or 2 DPI, some of this stuff. 
but from so far away, they are really, really crisp. Why? Because the viewing distance is so great that your eye perceives it as tiny dots. So the other thing as well to bear in mind when you're blowing up images is don't push the resolution so high that you're able to stand one foot away from the image because if the image is 10 meters wide, no one's going to stand that close to see it. So yeah, genuinely, um, as, as Kevin says, you know, do bear in mind your viewing distance before considering whether you need to blow something up um, or not. Uh, and Doug is online. Um, cool. There you go. Um, reference focus. Uh, one eye on the landscape and one eye on the waves. The tide just turned. I've I've been here. Well, not here exactly, but I've been in that one um, before. I've always ended up very wet. Um, yeah, and it, it's a challenge with all this stuff. And we talked about this a while ago on on Facebook um, as a group. But you're not there at the time, um, and I'm not there at the time. Um, we don't know whether this was ridiculously windy, ridiculously wavy. We didn't know. We don't know what lens choices someone has. We don't know um, the scenario, how long they had. You know, even things like the car was running out of parking and stuff like that. So we take it as read that the decisions that were made are the right decisions for the time, and then we'll deal with it from there. As I say, in a perfect world, you know, actually I'm saying the perfect world, in a perfect world for sharpness, this could have been focus stacked. But if that's not the effect that we wanted, then it doesn't need to be. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the right answer. It's just an answer. So in this case, all we're doing here in, in Doug's image is given that the foreground isn't that sharp, we're just pushing the customer, customer, pushing the viewer further up into the background towards where this subject is. Now, equally, we've got this sort of, it's a very bright area up here um, and it, it, it tapers off to the left and to the right. And I don't know whether that's an effect of maybe on the leaf filters they have the hood um, system, and sometimes that can that can slightly vignette into the edges. Um, but I'm tempted just to put another quick gradient in on the sky. It's not going to be very much, um, but just to soften, or sorry, just to darken down more importantly, that very, very edge up the top, probably about there. Again, it's so subtle, you know, a third of a stop. But it's just enough so that the the image doesn't get brighter as it gets to the edge and we're keeping the focus in the middle towards this rock now with the rock itself well we can get a bit clever here so i'm going to go onto here rock and i'm going to paint a very very rough mask over our rock i'm going to put our full flow on and for those of you that have been watching recently you'll be aware of how risky what i'm about to do is um, we're going to load a Luma range, and if Capture One crashes on me, I'm really sorry about that. We're still trying to work out what's going on. Um, so, Luma range. I've painted a very rough area, but I just want to capture this rock and some of the other ones. So I'm going to pull my Luma range down until I don't see too much of anything else being included. I'm going to pull this off, which is called the fall off, which is basically the difference between the levels. So, in this case, anything from zero to 42 is included in my mask. That's on a 0 to 255 scale. And anything at 87 is also included, but at 1% almost, let's call it that. And then as it gets darker and darker towards 42, as you can see that ramp happening, it gets more and more and more of the mask applied to it. Right, so let's try it. Yes, it, hey, cool. Okay, Luma range works. Isn't that cool? Right, so we have our Luma range. It's got some extra bit of the sky up here because this was the same numbers effectively as, as the rest of the rock. So just like with other stuff, I can go into my eraser tool. I'm going to make the brush a bit smaller and make my opacity up back at 100 and just delete that part of the mask. Here, I'm going to just manually have it fade off. So I'm actually going to use a low opacity and just brush in with a really soft brush so that it falls off quite nicely without a hard line where it finishes. Same with these rocks along here. So a low opacity gives me the benefit of every time I click, so with every mouse click, it's giving me an extra layer of 15% of a razor. So I can feather that in quite nicely and quite accurately across the whole image at the same time. Um, where are we? David's just asked, um, <laughs> I know the horizon tilted. What would it look like if you straightened it anyway? Yeah, I, 
yeah, we'll we'll give it a go in a second, um, just to see. But I'm I think it's going to look a bit weird. Um, so I'm going to just turn this mask off. So we've now drawn a rough mask over the rock. We've used the Luma range to um, stop any of the sky being captured in it. Oops, sorry, I zoomed in there. And because of that Luma range, we've now got a nice fall off. So it is affecting the darkest parts of the rock completely. And then as the rock gets lighter, it falls off slowly and has less of an effect. And with that selection made, I'm going to pull up our shadows a tiny bit and use a bit more clarity. So we go from there to there. Not huge amounts of change. And this is the, the you know, it's really important. Don't push this too far. We could actually push a bit of contrast in there as well. So it goes from here to here. All we're doing is just trying to brighten up these very darkest parts a little bit and get a bit more contrast and, and local contrast, which is what clarity does into those areas of those rocks without affecting the rest of the image, without affecting the sky, without affecting the foreground rocks. So it's a subtle change. It goes from there to there, but it's enough to lift it to make sure that it is definitely the subject of our shot. So that's where I would probably finish with this shot. It's a, it's a nice frame to start with, Doug. It's, it's, it's a really nice shot in, in general. Um, again, the the focus thing is down to you know if this is your subject then it's the right focal point um so i wouldn't worry about that the white balance thing is just a case of rather than doing the white balance across the global picture do it on that foreground now again as we always do we'll do a before and after but this is hopefully proof that each of those little changes if you remember are very small changes the white balance one's pretty big but all of the other stuff around putting in a, a gradient at the bottom, a gradient in the sky, they're all small, tiny shifts. One other thing I'm just going to do, actually, I've just noticed up here, is with our sky, I'm going to create a new one called Sky White Balance. I've noticed this cloud is a little bit green, tiny bit. Um, it's not the end of the world. But with that Sky White Balance, I'm just going to shift the tint a little bit to the right just to get rid of that green tint. Okay, so before and after. We go from here to here. And that's the key thing. It shouldn't be that it's a massive change. Yes, it looks improved, but it doesn't look like a different picture. And that's what we're always going for. Okay, let's give uh, David's go, uh, David's idea a go. Um, just turn off before and after and straighten it according to the rocks. I think the problem is going to be that this horizon is going to look wrong. Um, and it's not really a situation where we can keystone it. But let's just do that rock straighten instead. Oh, it's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> um, so yes, our rocks now look more straight. But to the detailed viewer, they're going to look in here and they're going to notice. Um, let me just put some guides on. It's interesting. I only got one. Um, they're going to notice pretty quickly that that horizon isn't straight over there. Um, yeah, I my temptation would be to stick with the true version um, rather than rather than playing around too much. Okay, so let's have a look at our next one, uh, Alessandro. So Alessandro sent a lot of um, images from Iceland across, and I think. The well, the question that Alessandro had was, how do I make these look more dark and moody, um, as it were, more like I guess there's lots of Iceland shots out there that look dark and moody, and, and how to get that sort of look. Um, again, we're going to start with lens corrections. I'm going to turn on diffraction correction because we're f11, not because necessarily um, it's a particularly diffracted image, but I know this lens very well. I've shot with it quite a lot, and at f11, it does have some issues at the edges, um, and it also has a bit of sharpness um, issues as it as it falls off out of the image, which is what the sharpness fall off tool is for. Okay, so we've got a bit of a we've got a definite tilt on this one, so I'm going to fix that first. But before, actually, before we do that, I'm just going to show you Alessandro's um, image. So the question was, how do I make this look more dark, moody, and dramatic? And this was the edit that Alessandro sent in. And honestly, it's a nice edit. Um, I, you know, it's it's a little too HDR'd in my head. Um, that you've lost a lot of the contrast, and that's the key for me. Which is because we've lost some contrast in it. 
we actually end up flattening the image. You lose some of the mood in the shot. And that, I think, is the, the real big challenge here. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is maybe introduce more contrast rather than flattening it out or flattening it out. And the flattening actually comes from mostly the use of the HDR tool. So I can pull back the highlights, pull back the whites, pull up the shadows, pull up the blacks. And, you know, we, it's not the same. It's not quite the same tint, but actually we can sort of fix that. We can get to, I don't know, somewhere around there. I'm, I'm just playing just so you can see the idea. We can get to something that looks like this. But all of that HDR work, we've lost the mood. We've lost the drama. We've gained all this detail back. But if the whole point was to make this shot look moody, we've lost that now. It now looks a bit storytelly. So I don't think storytelly is a word, but anyway, we'll go with it. So instead, let's have a little look. First thing I'm going to do, I'm actually going to just bring up the exposure a little bit. We can see on our histogram here, we've got quite a bit of room to play with. Before we even start with anything else, I'm just going to pull this up. It's effectively turning the lights on so I can see what we're doing. Let's go to half a stop. I am going to straighten the image. I've got two choices to do this. I can either straighten it or I can use the keystone tool to pull that horizontal line a little better. Let's just see what that's going to do for us. And it means that we can keep the bottom absolutely straight. The difference with the keystone tool, we're probably going to lose more as Capture One yeah, pulls it. So you'll see with a rotation tool, you'll actually see the whole image move around the same amount in every corner. So it's, it's symmetrical in all four corners. With the keystone tool, we're actually telling Capture One, pull that corner more than this corner and so on. The advantage on this shot is if I use the rotate tool, I actually lose the straightness of this waterfall coming down. Because as I tilt it, that waterfall is going to tilt as well. This way, effectively, what we've done is we've pulled this top left corner back out and pulled the right hand side out further. And what that's meant is we've kept the waterfall straight and central, not lost too much in this foreground. I'm actually going to change that crop to include even more of it while fixing this horizon issue. So that to me now looks a lot more straight. Whoops. Um, in fact, looking at it, I probably want to lose a bit more of the foreground maybe into there. Um, that'll do us there. Okay. So now what? Well, we've still got a lot more room that we can we can take these bright areas up to. Um, even if I turn on our exposure warning, there's nothing up there. Even the you know, in theory, the bright parts of the water or the bright parts of the sky, if we look at our numbers at the top of the screen, which is something that we should always keep an eye on, the luminosity of these, you can see it's 203, 201. That's probably the brightest part there. 204. Yeah, 206. Okay. So we've got an, a long way to go before we hit an absolute maximum of highlights. So let's fix that. Let's use our levels tool to pull it down to... I'm not going to go right the way down. You can see our exposure tool starting to, to warm up and tell us something's gone wrong. So left of there, let's just keep going to there. 213, that's not far off where we were at 206 at the start. And remember, you've got the middle slider in levels. So the top slider on the right-hand side pulls our highlights to be brighter. Bottom of the slider on the left-hand side pulls our shadows to be darker as I move it in. But this middle slider tells Capture One where to shift the data in the middle of the histogram. So all of the rest of it, without moving the left, without moving the right, so don't touch the highlights or the shadows, but shift the rest of the data to the left or to the right. And we can actually afford to shift this a little bit to the left just to get all that detail back. So we've now lifted the image, but we've still got all that contrast. So rather than getting contrast through doing an, an HDR effect on it, we've got contrast by using levels and by using exposure on their own just to pull that histogram wider and get the variance between the brights and the dark areas of the image to be greater. With that done, actually we can go even further. We can, let's use a little bit of a curve. So I want to leave my shadows exactly where they are. I don't want to touch them. So I'm going to put an anchor point on my curve here by clicking. That means that as I pull down this area here, I'm protecting the shadows. I'm actually going to pull that down a bit there as well to really um, keep it in place. But I've now got control of this highlight area or the, the upper mid-tone area independently. So I can make it very bright. Or in this case, I'm just going to 
drop it a little bit and again because we want that moody feel to this so we've got that cool what if we wanted to do a bit of negative dehaze just to flatten the image so remember active dehaze so adding it in we're going to get rid of all of that mist and all of the these the i guess water particles in the air and, and so on but it starts to look a little bit too rich we've, we've lost that moody feeling um, that we were going for so let's just reset that that's okay i'm actually tempted to just pull that a bit to the left you know maybe to there maybe not that much maybe that much just to flatten it so it was almost introducing haze or introducing mist just to make sure that we've got a nice even tone across the middle here so that that although i want the dark areas and i want that contrast to be used to make this look moody i also want this thing to look quite muted and dehaze is going to help me with that right let's have a little play maybe with our clarity so i'm going to use clarity just a bit here on the overall image you notice i'm actually i haven't moved from the background image but now I really want to attack the sky on its own. So I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to call it sky. And we're going to use our gradient layer again. So remember, most of the tools up here on the left, you can find in the toolbar at the top right as well. And I'm just going to... So remember that 100% and 0%. If I do this, it means that by the time I get to these rocks, it's having no effect at all again. So instead, I'm going to pull it down here to get to my 50% line near the top of the rocks. And then we're really going to push our luck today. We're going to do a Luma range on the gradient. And what we're going to do is we're going to exclude. I'm going to just make everything included in there to start with. And then exclude the dark areas of the rocks. So I've got a gradient, which means it's, it's fully masked at the top. 50% masked down here. And then it, it tapers off down to nothing. But then I've excluded the darkest parts of the image, i.e. the rocks completely from even that gradient as well hit apply we've now got a gradient layer with a luma range selected so only the values that are bright so in the sky are included and with that we can now pull back our highlights pull back the whites pull up our clarity and start to get the sky to pop so that's without and that's with and we get that moodiness in the clouds then as a result in fact we can even pull that a lot further and on one section of the image, if you really push that clarity up, it's not going to do too much damage in the sky. I'd just be careful about using it down here. Then for, let's say, the color grading. So let's create a filled layer. And I'm going to call this grading. I'm going to go to our color editor. So the color tab, the three little circles on the top left, and find our color balance tool. And to get that sort of moody feel to things, we're just going to pull the shadows down into the blue area. There we go. And our highlights a bit more warm, maybe into sort of uh, there, maybe the orangey yellow sort of area here. So I'm split toning. Effectively, we've split toned the image. With all of that done, I'm actually then going to do something very classic and use a little bit of vignette um, just to really focus the, um, the eye into the center. If we don't like that grading and there's a reason that we've done all of this stuff on layers, I can turn that off or I can turn it on again or I can back it away. So if I don't want 100% of that, I can pull that down to, you know, halfway, 50%. Actually, I prefer that. That all works and we now have a moody waterfall. If I go to the original, so our before and after, there's our first shot. There's our moody Iceland shot with all the details still in these rocks. Now, if I really want to make sure that this is you know because these are all basalt um basalt or basalt either way um these these columns are incredible this is um unless i'm wrong this is old ejarfoss in in iceland um which is a bit of a trek from where you can park in the winter um but these rocks actually really stand out in real life so i'm actually going to create a new layer called rocks oops and with our rocks layer brush 100% up. Uh, I'm going to actually use a low flow for once um, with a very soft edged brush. And I'm going to turn my mask on. So press the M button or go to this button here and say always display mask. And I'm going to just make sure that I get this rock here very roughly. Doesn't matter. Um, but with a nice soft edge. 
that's nicely feathered in and really strong in the middle. Turn my mask off. And with that layer, you can probably guess, we're going to use a bit of clarity and a bit of structure. And we're going to lift up the shadows a touch as well. Probably a bit more clarity and possibly a bit of contrast too. Then we get our feature back, those rocks. So without that layer, you can see it's a bit too flat, a bit too dark and moody. With it, it kind of works. And that's that's where I get to. So, you know, if we want Iceland shots to look moody, um, the clouds work for this on this one, Alessandro, but the rest of it, because it's been lifted, because effectively we've taken that whole histogram, the, the darks and the lights, and we've compressed it into the middle, and you can see on the histogram the result, you lose all the contrast um, instead of, you know, effectively leaving those darks where they were, leaving the midtones where they were, but just pulling in that top end. So going to our background layer, we've used the levels tool to pull it in um, and brighten up the overall image. We can now pull it a bit more as well. Um, Tom's just asked why the layer brush and not the style brushes. Well, interesting you should say that. Um, let's create a new variant of Alessandro's image. So with no other changes, of course, I could go into um, our style brushes and I could choose, oops, not those ones, one of these. Um, we could go into our enhancements and add some detail across here. And that's going to sharpen up those rocks quite nicely. We could increase our, uh, not brightness, we'll actually use a dodge brush um, and just brighten up these areas here. So I'm just doing sort of little alterations with the style brush and I'm making a pretty rough mask all the way around. Um, and then maybe we want to use our um, one of our favorite little ones, uh, which is deep sky, because that's quite fun. Um, and there we go, we've got our clouds back and actually we can use it on the water. But that's a very rough way of doing it and I'm not really controlling every little fine adjustment. So in this case, maybe I would have created a style brush for this um, and then used that against the whole series. So I've got another series of images um, from the same shoot that I wanted to use. Um, we could do that from a style brush. The one I'm tempted to use on here is actually that deep sky brush. A lot softer. Let's pull the hardness down. And I'm going to create a new quick layer with deep sky because I like that brush as Alex knows <laughs> capture one um, so let's just do that with our clouds now we're at risk of clipping some stuff and you can see my mask here goes over the rocks so what we're going to do again is go to a luma range and make sure we're excluding those rocks from the mask we're going to include all the highlights um, just so that we're not creating stuff that goes over areas that we didn't want it to but, you know, that mask, pretty cool, pretty dramatic. It's possibly over the top. We're starting to look a little bit um, drawn on the waterfall. So, again, the advantage with using layers to do this stuff and the style brushes is we can go in and we can back it away and we get to there pretty quickly. So, to me, you know, we go from there to there. That's as far as I'd push this one. I wouldn't push it up to here if you want the feeling of dark and moody. You know, this is a nice shot. Um... It's just this one is going to feel moodier um, if that was the intention with it. Okay, um, I was going to shift on to Claudio's image, but we're running out of time. So we will probably start next week with this shot. This is Canary Wolf. Um, so we'll start from here and about how to um, how to get back some of these highlights where there's only a tiny bit of highlight. What can you do to, um, to, to bring them out to the forefront of the shot? So we'll start with that next week. I'll just get rid of Tom's shot from the, um, from the thing. Sorry. Because I might have ruined what you were seeing <laughs> with this one with Tom's comment over the front. Um, so that's our shot from Alessandro. Um, you know, as I say, nice shot. We've just straightened it. We've just made it moody, which is what you wanted. Um, Doug, you know, hopefully this answers some of the questions of what you can do to, to balance out that white balance, especially when you're using filters with a heavy color cast. That can be a bit of a, a challenge, I know. Um, so hopefully that answers some of those questions and we get to a much more natural um, shot and hopefully we've had a play enough with those things so you can work out for yourselves which ones you want to use um, as I say in a minute you'll see in the description we'll add a link so that you can download those or these slides without my head it won't be in here um, for actual comparison one-to-one -one. 
Um, but in the meantime, so we will see you next Thursday. Um, obviously, we still have that Facebook group. Um, so you're all welcome to join in. Um, there are lots of conversations. I've been away for a couple of days shooting, um, but I'm back in the hood now, as it were. Um, and of course, you've also got the YouTube um, Pro Tips videos, which cover a lot of these tools individually. Um, so do make sure you check those out. They'll cover things like the Luma range stuff, how to do advanced masking and stuff. They're quick 20 minute things. Please do keep sending your images in. I know we only got to a couple today because we covered um, all of the super resolution stuff. Um, but next week, as I say, we'll start with Claudio's and we'll, we'll go on from there with a few more. And that just leaves me to say between now and next time, um, stay safe, do what you're told in general, because I know that's different in every place in the world right now. Um, but look after yourselves and we'll see you in a week. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.